Hey, hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of the OT Lifestyle Movement Podcast. I'm Rhiannon Crisp, occupational therapist, personal trainer, and founder of otlifestylemovement.com. Today, we are talking all about kids and conscious parenting with the passionate and incredibly knowledgeable and experienced OT, Tia Ganglin. Tia is a mother of four boys and has over 24 years of experience working as a pediatric occupational therapist in the US and abroad. She is the founder of Core Play, an online education platform for parents where she teaches developmental skills through active coaching to support children to meet their milestones from a model of wholeness and wellness before a child needs help. Tia has specialized skills and is trained in sensory integration and praxis testing, SOS feeding approach, therapeutic listening, astronaut training, handwriting without tears, and she is also a level three kinesio tapping practitioner and a certified paddle fit coach. Welcome, Tia. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here and I, I'm just, I'm loving being here and, um, and I've loved listening to your podcast and and um, all the wonderful things that you're doing for a lots of people just like me. So thanks for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. And I'm super excited to dive into this today because I can say I've watched so many of your Facebook lives and just your energy and enthusiasm and passion that you pour into this really comes through the screen. Like I can feel it, like that energy that you have for this topic around parenting and and what we can be doing and I, I think a lot of my questions will not only reflect my questions as an occupational therapist working with kids but also as a parent so I mm. think to for the OTs who are listening in you know we can sort of look at it through both lenses which is the benefit of this mm. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> before we before we dive into it Let's hit the rewind button and I'd love it if you can share with us a bit about your OT journey and how you came to do the work that you're doing today. Wow, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I started, I went to Lenore Ryan University in North Carolina. I was the first graduating class of their OTs back in the 1900s, um, the last millennial, and um, <laughs> and had the opportunity to um, learn from some of the most amazing uh, therapists there with and their primary focus was pediatrics. And I knew I always wanted to do pediatrics. I ended up, um, you know, working in Florida and South Carolina and Virginia, Ohio, and then South Carolina again. And then and um, ended up moving to Germany and working um, overseas in Germany for a while and then came back to the States and am now in Littleton, Colorado. Um, but when I, you know, in working, I, you know, I was known as the, the, the sensory guru, <laughs> whatever that means, <laughs> um, but just had a love for working with children and families. And I would start um, in every town that we moved into, um, I would start a pediatric special interest group on sensory processing disorder um, for parents and um, and for also the therapists that were local in the area and for any physicians in the area so that they could learn more about what sensory processing disorder was um, and how we can enter into that conversation with parents so that they understand that their kids aren't behaving poorly or that they understand that their kids aren't lazy and all those kinds of um, things that I think kids get labeled as um, when they struggle with that. Um, but those issues and pe people just don't understand what it means. Um, it's that invisibility of that. And so, um, but yeah, um, you know, one of the things that I did in South Carolina was I started the very, it was the second stand up paddleboarding team uh, for Special Olympics in the country. And um, that was a, that was an experience that kind of, I always say it kind of ruined me uh, um, as an OT. Uh, and it was because um, what I was seeing in starting this this uh, this program, this sport um, with our athletes, was that I wanted to have something different. First of all, um, for athletes, of, you know, in Special Olympics, because I wanted our the populations that we serve to be seen as strong and capable, and I wanted them to be seen as fierce, um, and I wanted 
I knew we had a strong community there in the Columbia area in South Carolina to support this team. And what happened as a result of that was not only we had an amazing team, um, but we also changed the community there and how they viewed individuals with intellectual disabilities. Um, from a therapy standpoint, what, what I saw was that these athletes who had autism and Down syndrome and cerebral palsy, their posture changed on a board um, when they would stand up and paddle. Um, in a way that I could never see happen in the school in the clinic, um, the young man who had autism he was had a, the flattest affect, flat as a pancake. Uh, but when he, that guy got up on the water, his face just beamed from ear to ear, and he would say, "Hi there, coach, to you." <laughs> and um, he just became so animated, and he just uh, just came alive with his social skills. And I never could have gotten that in the clinic. And it really ruined me as an OT and having worked in um, clinics and hospitals and home health and early intervention and schools, because it shone a light, I think. And it kind of got me back to the very basics as an OT to kind of say, you, you, this is all fluff. <laughs> like asking a parent, to work with their severe needs autistic child or their child with sensory processing disorder and do the things that I'm doing in a clinic with a ball pit, with a suspension um, you know, kit, with a acrobat swing, with all the bells and whistles and massagers and you know, all the things, you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, to ask a parent to do that, who's already overwhelmed, who already doesn't have any margin left in their life, um, who already, you know, isn't, isn't speaking the language that I'm speaking, to ask her to follow through with home programs that look like all the things that I'm doing. I had this kind of bright light that sh shone on me and said that I was, I, was dis I was part of the problem and not always part of the solution of this parent feeling like she had to change everything in order to meet the needs of her child. When what I deeply believe is that she's completely capable of meeting the needs of her child, but just reframing how she interacts and looking at what, what the world really looks like. Because the world doesn't look like my clinic. <laughs> the grocery store doesn't look like my, where this mom wants to do life and where school happens and where life happens, the occupations that this child engages with, with his family, don't look like my clinic. <laughs> <laughs> they, they look like outside, they look like being on the water, they look like leisure, they look like play. And as soon as I turned that corner, it ruined me of this classical sort of education that was wonderful and valuable and it helped build this strong foundation for me. But it gave me the ability to kind of branch out from that, I think, and say, no, we need a revolution for these kids and these families. We need, we need to be able to say you are capable and I'm going to help you become confident um, as a parent so that I can coach you through this because every pediatric therapist in the whole wide world knows that 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes a day doesn't amount to a hill of beans when it comes to children making success. And the way that our healthcare system works, we don't have the luxury of doing any sort of intensive therapy that would enable more of, um, you know, a focal sort of, um, you know, intensive sort of approach. And so we we have to understand that the person who's the intensive therapist, the 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 intensive partner in this is the caregiver. And as soon as we can reframe that and we can revolutionize how it is that we are delivering care and speaking about care, we're gonna empower parents to feel more confident so that we, they don't always have to say, oh no, I have to go to my therapist. That, so that we can say, no, I free you of that. And you can, lead, you can lead this conversation and you're capable to do that. And so it was a real shift. And it's embarrassing, I think a little bit to admit that I was you know, good 20 years well, a little bit less than that, 18 years into my career before I, I had that shift. And I think we all keep trying to like fit that circle into that square and say, okay, you know, here's how you can do it. Let me accommodate and let me adapt and let me do this so that you can feel confident and you can do these things at home. You know, let me modify this brushing program, even though I'm just not sure if it's going to work or let me fix this a little bit so that maybe it'll work for you. When we just needed to kind of shed it all and get out on the water <laughs> and see kids standing on paddle boards and say, oh, well, uh, yeah, this pretty much does the job. <laughs> wow. Tia, oh my gosh. 
so much is landing with me. You are absolutely speaking my language. And what I'm hearing from you is that you really made this shift to working with real people in the real life context of their life. So instead of this fabricated sort of clinical setting where there's fluorescent lighting and bright colored toys and plastic things that the clients don't have in their home, they don't have these resources that we have access to. We're only seeing them for maybe one hour a week or one hour a fortnight. Instead empowering, and not even empowering because like you said, that the parents already have that innate capacity. It's just about shining that light and, and being that tour guide for them basically um, and showing them how they can support their kids in their real life context. And this, this is what it's all about because like you said, we don't want families running back to us in a year time or in two years time when they have another problem and something else crops up we want them to understand that they already have the answers within them it's yes. about building up these problem solving tools and skills and that toolbox for them so that they can draw upon that when the next challenge and challenge arises um so i absolutely love that I'd love I love I love what you said about tour guide that I'm writing it down because I love that language I love that because really that's all we are we are we are a tour guide almost in their lives like we're almost we're visiting you know this life and we have to have the humility and the vulnerability to say to step aside and walk alongside I think is a big part of what our role is and I think sometimes we get in our own, I know I get in my own head <laughs> sometimes, and I have to kind of back it off and say, okay, here, let's regroup, <laughs> let's reframe what's going on uh, and move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love what you just said then, the vulnerability, because basically, you know, we do not have all the answers. And I feel like sometimes as professionals, we feel like we need to wear this expert hat and to have all these answers ready for our clients. Almost like this prescription ready to go. Okay, they come in with this challenge. This is what we do for this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we did in the early days when we're a new grad, like we're kind of rote learn that stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. and then as we grow and become more comfortable in the role, we realize that, you know, this family, this child's life is completely different to the child that I saw yesterday or the child that I saw an hour ago. They need completely different strategies. They need a completely different approach. Mm -hmm. And so um, really coming in with that vulnerability and saying, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I'm willing to walk alongside you on this journey yes. and, and go through this process with you uh, to help you reach the goals that you have is, is foundational for the work that we do. Because at the end of the day, our focus is on occupation and the occupation is meaningful to the client. And what we might view through our lens as helpful and meaningful is not always realistic for the client. It's not always going to work with their lifestyle and their pressure challenges and, and what's going on right now for them. So really being curious, being insatiably curious and working out how it is that we can support them. Well, and I think, you know, you hit the nail right on the head because I think if, especially as pediatric OTs, if we don't abide by the golden rule, which is the expert on that child is always the parent. If we don't if we don't abide by that rule and start off, start from, from that space and move outward, um, we're, we're going to fail in being, um, a, a good, a good fit for working with families and children. I mean, I mean, that's just the bottom line. And I don't, I don't know how I could say that any stronger, um, because we don't live, we're not waking up, you know, all hours of the night with that child who has autism, who won't stay out of the kitchen and slamming the doors and breaking things. We're not living in the life where they feel like a prisoner in their own home. And the, the, the parent is always the expert on their child, always. 
Um, and I think coming from that and understanding that is the golden rule. Um, and I think the other part of that, what, what I heard you say there was talking about identity and how as therapists, we kind of, we, and just like parents, and I think of anyone in any profession, leaning into that identity and owning an identity, it, it takes time and it takes mentorship. And I think sometimes, yes, we might have a lot of knowledge about sensory processing disorder or children with developmental delays or some different kinds of, you know, ways that we can get what it is that we want to get out of a, you know, working on a, a child with torticollis and tummy time. We might have little, little tricks, but the ultimate part of that is that parent needs to lean into the identity of being a parent who has a child who might have some special needs and owning all the skills and tools that we provide them on a daily basis to make it part of their life. And if we just take over and say, I'm going to be in this sterile environment with all my bells and whistles and tools, we are disempowering parents um, from the get-go. And we're saying, oh, it, no, you can't do this. You, you, let me do it. Let me do it. Let me show you how. You know, if we're not coming alongside, putting our hands on the parent and caregiver and showing them for with every step of the way, um, walking alongside them, um, we're, we're missing the boat. We are missing how we are key players in mentoring and coaching parents. Mm. Yeah. And I love that this is a focus of yours because it's also a focus of mine. And I think this is sometimes a big piece that we miss. You know, parents will often be passive in the therapy process, not active. Mm -hmm. um, and so remembering that that is such a big part because they also come with their own needs and their own abilities and their own capacity. Baggage and their own yeah. baggage. <laughs> Trauma, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think uh, um, you know, and I this is funny because I'm about to do it and I'm going to, because what I want to do all the time is I want to say, oh, but this is what we can do. <laughs> You know, when, when we find ourselves with that passive parent, engaging them in what we are so good at, I think is the best way to get investment and buy-in. If we can say this, and, and even in our minds, I think, say this is pointing in the direction of this. Like, yeah, I know I'm doing this work on the ball, but this is pointing in the direction of your child being able to sit independently. If we always point back to function, which I think that we always get, we are always doing that in our mind, but we are not saying it out loud and we're not saying it overtly. And that really comes down, comes back to my whole argument with play. If we don't say overtly how this is attached to this, how these two things are so uniquely and um, you, you can't separate these things, you can't separate tummy time from athleticism and core strength and fine motor skill. You can't separate them because they are essential. Yeah, you might get there eventually, but it's not gonna be the quality of movement, the quality of skill, the quality of coordination if you don't go through these stages of development. Anyway, but I think we we have that unique ability to be able to link those things, the 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 action, like what it is that we're doing and why it's important, always pointing in the direction of what function, function, function is. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And from the parent's perspective, they might be looking at a therapy session and going, oh, my OT only plays Twister with the kids or they're always on the playground. You know, this is not worth my time. It's not worth my money. It's not worth my energy. I can do this with my kid on the weekend. They're not, you know, it's kind of like we've got, we're the duck on the water with these feet going underneath. We're thinking yes, of all yes, the yes. things, like all the underlying skills and components that yes. make up whatever that occupation is um, that we're working towards. So, yeah, I think that's... Well, and for us, it's like, it's like breathing. We don't even think about, do you know the, do you know the term um, unconsciously competent? like where you are unconsciously competent. You don't need to say out loud what it is that you're doing and why you're doing because you are unconsciously competent. And sometimes it's hard to back it up and say, this is what I'm pointing to. And um, whenever we do new things, it's that, that consciously competent. Can you ask your brother? I'm sorry, I have a, I have a six-year-old. Ask, ask Roman to do it, sweet pea. Okay, thank you. Um, anyway, <laughs> but, but that unconscious, competence that we just live and breathe with where we have to intentionally um, and overtly say this what I'm doing right here is pointing to this and we have to do it with development we have to do it with all the weird things that we're doing as therapists too I think so mm. yeah can you talk to us Tia about why play is so important to you what is it about play that just lights your fire because I know it does <laughs> here we go <laughs> 
Bill, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> you, know, you know what? Um, I think that um, it is it is the primary modality that we as OTs use. And it's um, I I always said that when I was younger, I wanted to find a job where I could play for a living, um, and I found that job. Uh, but playing with purpose. Play is always pointing in the direction of, of higher skills, of other skills. Um, and we all are playing even now. Um, we call it leisure interest, but it, it's fundamentally it's play. Um, biking, you started off by playing by biking. Rock climbing, you started off by climbing trees. You know, all the things that we do are based in play, all everything. Play is a gives us this beautiful regulated state that enable, uh, enables us to have, um, you know, to, to do all the thinking that's involved um, with harder skills, like all the things that we practice as kids, all that back and forth um, negotiation with peers of problem solving and um, collaborating, all of that that we practice in play in the kitchens that we make, the mud kitchens outside and negotiating across rivers and streams um, and working towards a common goal, that's all based in play. And everything that we do right now as adults is the exact same thing, but we just call it different. We call it, you know, we call it, um, you know, negotiating at the at the table and all all these fancy business words that OTs don't know. But anyways, <laughs> um, but everything that we do, everything that we do is based in play, and play is that great regulator. If you look at the um, if you look at the, what was it, the hierarchy of learning or the, oh, the pyramid of learning. Do you remember that one by Shell, by Schellenberger and, um, oh, who was the other person that she did that with? Anyway, but basically the higher, the, the, the pyramid of learning talks about how you have to have this regulated state before you ever get to academic learning. And that regulated state is accomplished whenever you have a, um, a, a nice calm state of arousal, you understand your sensory system, you understand your sense, you feel safe from a sensory motor standpoint, you're not falling down because you don't know where your sense of balance is. And all those skills, all these skills stack on top of each other until you get to the tippy top, which is academic learning. But if you don't have this regulated state, if you don't have um, the ability to understand how your body interacts with one another, how, how to, how do your limbs interact with your trunk and how that interacts with space and time and, and other people, if you don't have that, you're not going to get to the top. And if we can't address all these foundational fundamental skills through play of learning about our bodies, learning about how we interact with peers, learning about movement, time and space, that temporal aspect, if we can't understand that, it's it's your go. It's almost like you're going around your backside to get to your thumb constantly because the brain doesn't wire as efficiently um, as it should. And so it's harder for these kids. It's harder for these kids to learn. It's harder for these kids to motor plan. It's harder for these kids to pivot and make adjustments from an executive functioning standpoint. And it all comes down to learning. And if we continue to say, oh no, we're gonna we're gonna do the upside down triangle, where <laughs> you have to you have to be able to um, start with academic learning, and then we'll address all this other stuff. We are setting kids up for failure. Because but isn't that not... what's happening right now? Yes. Right, kids are all starting school younger. They're, they're, I walk into a kindergarten class and I don't even understand half the language and everything that they're going on about. Honestly, there is so much pressure for kids to learn, yes. learn, learn yes. really young and not enough emphasis on playtime and creativity and being in the moment and just that organic, meaningful play experiences. And like you said, that foundation, we can't leapfrog stages of progression. We can't forget about learning about the body and learning about how we interact and feeling safe in our environment because we feel safe in, in our own skin and jump straight to academic learning, you know, maths and English and whatever else. You know, at the end of the day, what's most important and what you talk about a lot is this identity and this just feeling of safety and security and understanding ourselves. And if we don't, if we miss that, you know, children are going to grow up with challenges Splinter later skills. on. They're going to grow up with splinter skills where they, nothing comes together and it's, it's harder for them because they're not building that self-esteem and understanding all the complexities that they have. And it's, it's heartbreaking. It is absolutely heartbreaking because you can see it in how kids interact when you walk into a classroom. 
you, and you can see the skills that are missing and it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And then you're asking them to do all cortical activities, all this, you know, higher level thinking. And they, you want them to make a cross <laughs> when they don't even understand how their body connects to their trunk, when they can't even visually cross the midline, you know, you, you, you can't, you can't put the cart before the horse. And as much as you want to try, there's, I know you got some sayings down in Australia, but down in the <laughs> South of the United States, it's like teaching the pig to dance. All you do is frustrate yourself and annoy the pig because <laughs> it's putting the cart before the horse. And it's not, it's not meeting people where they are. And I, I think that that is the unique lens that we can bring to the table is we have to reorient ourselves to understanding development. And we have to reorient ourselves into understanding how we as OTs are key players in advocates for play for children. And how I, I, would, I would love to put every therapist who works in pediatrics out of work because we do this so good. You know, I would, we always say that we love it when people come in, but we love it even more when they go, because we don't, we don't want the dependency. We want the independence of these families and children and teachers and educators. We, we want that to happen, but I just feel as though we have to get back down to advocating for children to be able to play first, play with purpose. And that's why I started core play is because I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. And I, I was listening to a podcast the other day and it was interesting. He was talking about how from, from kids, you know, as soon as they're born until they're about five, we're encouraging them to walk and to talk and to develop all these skills. As soon as they turn five and they're in school, we're telling them to sit down and shut up and yes. follow the rules and, yes. and this really compliance-based Yes. yes. Uh, almost fear driven, do what I say or else. Yes. And yes. Yes. this, you know, I, I suppose I've only been reflecting on this more recently in terms of the traditional schooling system and how maybe it's a little bit different to how I would like to see my kids in school. Mm -hmm. um, I know my daughter has, there's a, there's a chair at school. I'm not sure what it's called. I know some parents have like the naughty chair or the red chair where it's, it's like timeout chair or a timeout oh. corner. Um, and, you know, I don't have any, you know, we, we only do what we do because that's all we know in the moment. And we always, as parents, as educators, we are always doing the best with what we know and with what we've been taught and the information that has been handed to us. But I suppose I'd love it if we could explore even... Um, Specifically as it relates to boundaries, because I feel parents, in, in myself included, um, have challenges with setting these boundaries for kids, boundaries that are loving and compassionate, but also sticking to them. So we, we have different parenting approaches, right? We have like the authoritarian parent who is very much, th these are the rules, you've got to stick by them, very compliance-based, fear-driven, they might be yelling or um, you know, go to your room or sit in timeout kind of behavior uh, approaches. And then there's the other end of the spectrum where the parents are more flexible and very doting and very much, um, they probably don't set any boundaries. And if they do, they're likely to say or give in to that. You know, if the child persists enough, they'll say, oh, you know, I choose my battles. So I'm going to, I'm going to, fall back on that boundary. They can, they can go ahead and do X, Y, and Z, even though I said they couldn't a minute ago. Um, and I feel like we need to be somewhere in between this, mm -hmm. this middle approach where we are setting boundaries, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they are loving and they're compassionate and we're consistent with that. Mm -hmm. Can you shed some light on this and how we can, how we can talk to parents about this? Because it can be challenging because mm -hmm. I, I feel like sometimes speaking to parents, we don't want to come in as the expert and say they're doing it wrong. Right, right. How, how do we have these conversations? That is, I love, I love the way you frame that question. Um, I, it's funny that you say this because I was reflecting on this the other day about how there are so many different kinds of parenting. It's ridiculous. And it's almost like I've got my badge that says I'm an attachment parent and I'm a badge that says I'm a gentle parent. I have a badge that says I'm a free rate. And it's like, <laughs> oh, sweet Lord. 
<laughs> you know what you're doing is you're cornering yourself into this space that gives you all these absolutes when I'm not sure that's really what you wanted to do. And it, and then the, then there's this, this methodology that if you don't follow it rigidly, then you feel you shame spiral or you judge other people. And it's like, how are we lifting each other up as women, as caregivers, as partners in this life for the good of our children. And so I have a real problem with all these labels and these, these little sororities and fraternities of, of labels of parents. And it really, um, it, it doesn't serve our children, um, I think is the bottom line. I think that your, your parenting, when you've got kids, especially if you've got more than one, you are parenting minute by minute. <laughs> and, um, or at least until you can get that glass of wine at the end of the day. <laughs> but, um, but I think my point being is that it all comes down to um, really what I, what I built core play on. It's responsive parenting. And I think it comes down to relational, um, relational parenting and starting from a place of relationship, respect, and, res and re being responsive. And I think that is, that's the bottom line. And even to, I have a 17, a 15, a 13, and I have a six-year-old in my house. And, um, you know, we have started from the very beginning of life with responsive parenting. And it may have looked like attachment parenting at one point. It may have looked like um, gentle parenting or positive parenting. It may have looked like that Yale parenting at one point too. I'm not going to lie <laughs> because I do have, I do have boys, but anyways, um, the bottom line being is that when we are responsive, when we pay attention to our children, when we are observing what makes them tick, when we are, um, understanding and treating them with respect by the way that we interact with them. We are setting ourselves up for life with our children of responsive parenting. Like when we, when our children were young as therapists, we know this, this term that's um, kind of a coin phrase now it's called serve and return where our children do something and we um, respond to them and then they do something and we respond. And we know from a neurological standpoint that that builds strong brain architecture, that builds a strong foundation for our children as they continue to develop. And that doesn't go away. Our children say, well, I wanna go outside in, in, you know, in just socks. And, and we have to say, we, th that's their serve. Well, how do we return that? Do we say, no, you're not gonna go outside. We're gonna say, well, what would that look like to go outside? in your socks, how, how is that gonna, and, and, then you, and then I think that's the point we have to figure out which ditch do you wanna die in? And you know, but you have to be an inquisitive parent. You have to have the time, you have to have the time to play attention. You have to understand also what your boundaries are and what your um, baggage is that you bring into the in, you know, into that conversation too. I think if you tend to be a little bit more rigid in your parenting under, under like, I know I'm an Enneagram one. I know that I have, I, I got my issues, <laughs> but I also share my issues with my children and say, you know what, this is more about me than it is about you. If you want to go outside in your socks that already have holes in them, you know, it, just remember that there are thorns in the bushes and that that might be a factor that you want to consider. But ultimately we can't micromanage our children because we're never gonna get them to the space of, of adulthood. And setting boundaries is also about having conversations about those boundaries. And again, it's, you know what? It's coming alongside our children, just like we come alongside our, our clients and it's coaching our kids instead of bossing our children around <laughs> mm. because no one likes to feel like they are not in charge. They have no agency. No one likes to feel that. And we are in the business of giving people independence. And how do we how do we respond to our children, given what's going on in their environment, given what activities they're engaging in on their on a minute by minute basis when we are involved in their lives? How do we how do we play that game that serve and return? Because it, it doesn't go away. It doesn't go away in early childhood. You continue to serve and return all the way through high school. Well, what do you think you're, you know, tell me a little bit about what you, what is reasonable for your screen time right now? And my son, Abel, and I have conversations about that all the time. Tell me, I, I, I know that we decided on an hour. I, I noticed that you're, you were on for an hour and 45 minutes. Let's talk about what, what's going to happen next. Let's, what, what's reasonable, you know, because I, I don't want to be that parent, yeah. <laughs> you know? 
And I, I, I want to build respect and I want to teach my child how to negotiate. I want to teach my child how to maintain boundaries and to also say, yeah, I really screwed that up. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. I messed that up. I, I, I want to make it better. You know, mm -hmm. I want to be reconciled in this relationship. Does that make sense? hundred percent. And what I love about how you ask those questions. So say, for example, your kid wants to go outside wearing socks instead of asking why questions you asked what questions so you asked what would that look like and i think this is such an important thing to pick up on because if parents are questioning and it sounds if they're saying oh why would you do that it, it's it's a very it's very much like the same question but it's much more intimidating and mm -hmm. putting pressure on them like why would you do that like you're questioning why they would do that instead of saying what would that look like? It's much more open and provides more space for the kid. Um, it's less fear driven question. So well, I, I think that. you're also tapping into that creativity of of Problem projected solving. action mm -hmm. of projected action sequences is well, if I do this, then then what will it look like? And again, it goes back to that executive functioning skill that I think so many children are missing right now of saying, okay, well, what would it look like if I did this right now? And what, you know, what would the consequences be? And am I okay with those consequences? And maybe you are, and that's fine, you know, but there, I'm going to let you own those consequences. <laughs> do you yes. know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I need 100%. You to own that. And I feel um, like sometimes we try and protect our kids too much and we just do it for them because it's quicker and easier and we tell them what to do rather than getting them to think and problem solve for themselves so I love that I'm wondering if we can change topic a little bit and and talk about self-regulation because this is something that I would love to talk about with you and mm -hmm. it's something that comes up a lot in therapy and as OTs is this idea around self-regulation and our kids aren't regulated and there's there's they've got too much attention challenges or they're not um they're not focused in school when they should be paying attention or they've got too much energy or xyz you know they're not regulated mm -hmm. um and obviously self-regulation is our ability to or our capacity to modulate our emotional and behavioral responses in response to like stressful situations. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we forget as parents and as teachers and as therapists that, you know, tantrums and meltdowns and whinging can be completely quote unquote normal behavior. You know, these are things that our kids will go through to grow through their processes and to their next stage of development. Um, but I feel like there's such negative connotations around tantrums and meltdowns and that meltdowns are okay, but tantrums aren't and, you know, all this talk around that. Mm -hmm. um, when really, you know, we don't develop the capacity to regulate until we're adults. And even now, you know, I still have challenges with yep. regulating myself and we all yeah. do, like no one's perfect. We all have these tipping points and that there'll be, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back mm -hmm. and we can't cope anymore. Um, and maybe we have done a lot of personal development mm -hmm. and we have a lot of strategies and tools in our own personal toolbox. Mm -hmm. But I feel a lot of times parents don't have that level of awareness and mm -hmm. they aren't always modelling the behavior they want to see in their kids so they might raise their voice or get angry and you know it's this back and forth the kids are, are, are modeling that back um but i'd love it if you could share some thoughts or whatever comes up for you around self-regulation and our kids yeah well i think um that's a really good topic because it is, and self-regulation is always that buzzword I always hear whenever I would go into schools. Oh, he's just not self-regulated. And oh, he's just having such a hard time with self-regulation. And I remember thinking, huh, I, I wonder if you know what that means. <laughs> Oftentimes I'd wonder that because exactly like you said, we're not able to develop those skills of self-regulation really and maturely until we, you know, we're like our, our frontal lobes are developed <laughs> for the love of God, right? And I think we have to remember that there is that other, that other, 
her sister, that like that stepsister of, of self-regulation, which is co-regulation. And that's the ability to borrow from somebody else's regulated state. Now, the person you're going to borrow that regulated state from is someone who's who's trusted. You trust that person. You trust that person as a secure human in your life. If you don't feel safe in your environment, whether it's school or whether it's a playground or whether it's, you know, the grocery store where there's, you know, lights and information coming at you from all directions. If you don't feel like you can access someone to help you with that co-regulation, someone, you know, to borrow from, um, then, then you're not going to achieve that state of self-regulation. You're not going to achieve a regulated state. And again, it's that pyramid again. If you don't feel safe in that bottom of that pyramid, you're not going to get to higher level thinking. You're, you're, you're going to lose the ability to um, reason or say, oh, this, you know, this, I'm having a hard time with this or, or to be able to play with the your peers. You can't get to that sensory motor phase if on the very basic level, you don't feel safe and you don't have someone to borrow the safety from. And so there's, there's that aspect of it, which I think is really important for, for parents and educators um, to be able to understand is that, that co-regulation piece. Um, Can I just interject yeah. there, Tia? Yeah, so yeah. for OTs who are listening and they want to educate parents on co-regulation, what are some ways that parents can co-regulate? Like there's obviously different ways that they can do that. Can you give us some tips on that? Yeah, I think, um, I, th- I think one of the big things is that you have to understand that you are, um, we used to say this to my son all the time, you set the tone. And if your tone is dysregulated, if you're in a space like you're, uh, what you're bringing into the, the situation in this space is a space that's dysregulated. You you have to find some space in yourself where you're able to set the tone. You're not gonna be able to help this little human. Um, And so whether it is, you know, a safe word for yourself or it's your own ability to take those deep breaths or it's your own ability to to do the five things that you see in your environment, you smell, you taste, you, you know, those, those types of things where you're able to get yourself to a space, you know, or just take a moment. Um, You have to find your regulated space first. I think another thing to help your child, if you do find yourself in that regulated space with a little one who's just having a hard time bring yourself down. <laughs> and sometimes, um, sometimes I, this is a, this, there was a really great quote that sometimes the, the kids who, who look like um, they don't, they, what is the, oh, I'm going to mess up the phrase. I'm horrible <laughs> at these things. It's the one where, you know, the kids who, um, who, who, you know, you, you don't necessarily always want to go and hug are the ones that need it the most. Somebody said it much better than that, <laughs> but um but sometimes, and remembering falling back as an OT on all those, those sensory regulation principles, that proprioception is the great regulator, that deep pressure is the great regulator, and, and, and trying so hard to convince that caregiver that sometimes just bring yourself down. As in present, down to their level. Yes, yes, to eye level with your little one. And listen and listen more and talk less, (laughs) listen more and talk less. I hear, I hear that you're upset. Um, One one of the best things that I always would do with kiddos and teach parents is leave the space. So I'm sad. If I see a child is sad, I would say I'm sad because, and I'd leave the space because the first thing that children lose when they're dysregulated is meaningful speech. And so what you want to do is you want to enable them to be in a space where they can communicate what they're feeling in their bodies. And by setting the space up, by bringing yourself down, by saying, I'm not going to loom above you way up here. (laughs) I'm going to bring myself to your level. I'm going to be in a space that looks like I'm almost cocooning you. And I'm going to say to you that I am interested. I'm listening. I am here. We can work this out together with a little one, I think is one of the best places to start. I'm Mm -hmm. sad because leave the space and let them fill it in. If I'm, I'm angry because I'm frustrated because and giving them the language, but allow them the space to fill in where they are, what they're feeling. Yeah, and it's so interesting that you said that the first thing that kids lose when when they're in that dysregulated state is meaningful speech. Mm-hmm. How often do we as parents go, use your words, you know, use your words, yes. tell me what's wrong, yes. use your words. You know, we want to yes. know what's wrong. And, yes. you know, often yes. it comes from a very 
um, heartfelt <laughs> place of wanting to help, yeah. but they well, cannot the access dopamine. that part that's, of the brain. They're yeah. in the, they're in that emotional part of the brain. That right? amygdala. They are all amygdala, <laughs> and mm -hmm. I think it's an it's an adult need. We're we're trying to, and it's it's one of the things that we have to reframe, we have to revolutionize the way that we look at that interaction. And we have to reframe. It's the same thing of giving adult emotion to children. It's not fair <laughs> um, of saying that, you know, well, what, what, why can't you figure this out? Well, they don't have all the coping skills. They don't have all the, the connections made yet. They still have a whole lot of plugs that aren't even plugged in. Um, and we are there to help teach them how to plug those things in. We are there to provide that bottom of the, of the pyramid so that they can get to the state of being able to plug those things in. And we have to be the person that they borrow from that regulated state in order to figure that those things out. We have to scaffold underneath them and give them the language so that when they get older, when they can figure things out, when they can access the words, I'm sad because, I'm mad because, I'm frustrated because, they can start to say those sentences. Mm. When we get down and tell, tell me, use, you know, use your words. I don't think it's a horrible thing, but I think that being in tune and being responsive and understanding where your child is a huge part of mm. that, of that piece of the puzzle. And sometimes language isn't even needed. Sometimes it is, right. or a lot of the time it's just being present and just being yes. there and holding that space for them and yes. that empathy. You know, I think it starts with empathy, but it, it doesn't end there. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to know what what comes to mind when you hear conscious parenting. What does that mean to you? Conscious parenting. <clears throat> well, as opposed to unconscious parenting, it can't be very effective. <laughs> um, I think it's. I think I really feel like it's responsive. I think it's it's paying attention. Uh, that's what I hear when I hear those words. Is um, it's paying attention to um to yourself as a parent and not just always focusing on your child but understanding how where you are in relationship to your child but also understanding the needs of your child i think is 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 is, is a big part of that um yeah that's mm. that's kind of what i think mm. no i love that um mm -hmm. so let's start to wrap it up i mean we could go on forever there's so much that i'd love to talk about with you um mm -hmm. But I know time is of the essence. Are there any more practical tips or tools for OTs who are listening in who are working with kids mm -hmm. or who are working with parents or who want to do more of parent coaching? Mm -hmm. What are some tips and tools that you could give them to walk away with? Well, one of the, um, oh, I, I hope I don't go on too long. <laughs> You just cut me off and well, I won't take it personally at all. But I think, um, you know, I think it's really good to have a framework, a, like a systematic framework that you coach parents on that you, that you also use as an OT. I think we have such valuable skills and we are so um, unconsciously competent about how we systematically look at an environment and an activity and how we analyze and reanalyze and we do it in a split second. And I think there is the ability, having worked in early intervention, that we can help coach parents on how to look at the environment and how to look at activities and how to look at responses and then make changes to the environment and make changes to the activities in order to get the responses that we want. But I think it takes a systematic um, way to do that. That's what I do on core play is I, is I explain all the areas of environment, the temporal environment, the physical environment, the personal environment, all the things that make up those things of where your child is in the world right now and what you should be expecting from your child right now. And so that your expectations as a parent aren't so high or they aren't so low, but they're in that kind of just right of knowing what direction from a developmental standpoint your child is, is pointed in, helps you better understand the environment that you're working in. And, and you know, if your child only has a 30 minute attention span um, for busy life, well, what is that? How is that gonna direct the places and things that you do in life? 
And then looking at activities, you know, activities we know need to be appropriate, they need to be child centered, and they need to involve some aspect of serve and return. Well, what does it look like for an activity to be appropriate? So your child might be melting down because the activity isn't appropriate. It's too, it's too high level, it's or it's too low level for them. They're bored with it, or they're frustrated. How do we work on finding that just right challenge? And then looking at, well, how do you, how do you maintain child centered play? Because that's where optimal learning happens. And what does that look like? And how do you enter into that as a parent. And then looking at the um, at serve and return, which we, we touched on earlier, it's how do you help activities become rich with that serve and return? How do you bond with your child, build their self-esteem, build their self-efficacy by sometimes, you know, engaging in that serve and return, but also backing off and allowing the flow to happen. How does, how is that part of serve and return? And then taking a look at responses. Well, how does your child respond to the activities and the environments? And how do you, as, as that caregiver, uh, you know, use your ability to help with co-regulation, to change environment and to change activities, to help find that just right challenge for your child. And I think as OTs, we can teach parents how we systematically look at the environment, how we we look at activities and how we look at responses in because of those two factors and use that as a framework to help parents um, parent response um, re responsively um, with their child parent consciously and parent with purpose um, in using play as a modality to get there did I go on too long I'm sorry no that was great that was a great summary because <laughs> I have seen I have seen you've got a video on your Facebook page about mm -hmm. this framework and I did watch that and I found it really interesting um so is, is this framework called something is this the core play framework or that's the EAR triangle the lens through which we see everything we're doing core play <laughs> that's my fancy voice you got my fancy voice <laughs> <laughs> awesome okay cool so let's head to the we've got three rapid fire questions are you ready yes. for those I'm ready, prepared. girl. No. <laughs> you don't know what's coming. All right, number one. In one sentence, how do you describe OT? Mm. Um, I think with, I think we are the meaning makers. I think um, with our holistic approach that we have to seeing every um, individual in their uniqueness, I think we're able to make um, meaning out of the messes that come from illness and disability and injury. I think we're the meaning makers. I yeah. absolutely love that. Meaning out of the messes. Okay. Yeah. Number two, what's one healthy lifestyle habit listeners can implement today? Could you say that one lifestyle habit? Say that one more time. Yeah. Sorry. One healthy lifestyle habit listeners can implement today. Oh, hmm. I think, um, Take a look at your leisure interests. Reframe how you see your leisure interests. Um, understand the foundation of them and the importance of how, of what play did to get you to that point and what happens to your body and your mind when you engage in those leisure interests. Be aware of that um, in, in, how, in how you're using that, uh, that play or that leisure interest to help feed you. Mm, reconnect with that joy. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Number three, if you could only offer one piece of advice to OTs, mm. what would it be? Well, I got a perfect answer for that one. Um, <laughs> I had the best advice that was ever given to me by a supervisor that I worked with. Her name was Lauren Gardner. This is in Germany. And she said to me, um, she said, we were talking about, um, I, it's not relevant. But anyways, the, the piece of advice would be um, the answer is always no until you ask. And I think when when you when you're looking at that phrase, look at what feeds your passion um, as an OT. And there are no uh, limits there. And the answer is is always going to be no until you try. The answer is always going to be no until you until you ask. So make sure you ask. <laughs> make sure mm. you forward and follow your passion mm, i love that all right tia how does everyone find you where do where do we connect oh you can find me on facebook at core play um just can you spell there. that out oh yes it's k-o-r-p-l-a-y uh, i'm on facebook i'm on um, instagram i just started my instagram feeds and i'm a newbie instagrammer 
um, it, it, and that um, that's core play with purpose. Um, you can also uh, direct message me on Facebook. Um, and oh, oh, I have something special. Um, if you would like um, a free mini milestone book that I just finished and is going to be up here um, today, actually, you can find that at coreplay.com backslash milestones. And that will also um, uh, keep you on our wait list for our um, courses that are going to be launching here in the next couple months. Awesome. I'm super excited about that. And by the time this is, it'll probably be all up and running. Is that, can I ask, is the platform, is the core play platform, mm -hmm. it's educational, it's predominantly developed for parents. Is it also valuable for occupational therapists wanting to learn about milestones and development and maybe if they're parents as well, it's a double bonus. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's definitely geared towards um, using that framework, that EAR framework. It has a success path, a four-step success path, um, and it's broken down into um, uh, zero. Right, right now, it moves from zero up to 12 months, but the goal is it for it to move all the way up to three years. Um, and it's, it is definitely, I think, very helpful for um, therapists um, and, or, or early childhood professionals, um, but it's targeted towards parents and caregivers, um, but it certainly is helpful for, especially for new therapists, just starting out working in um, early intervention, I think, too. Um, well, I think it's great that it is targeted towards parents, and as an OT coming into it, mm -hmm. we kind of get the benefit of picking up the language and of how an experienced OT is talking to parents and talking mm. with parents. I think it has that benefit as well. So yeah, definitely go check it out, call play. And thank you so much, Tia. I really appreciate oh, all your time lovely. and wisdom and it's been heaps of fun. Awesome. It was great to talk with you too. Thanks so much for having me on. <laughs>